Hey everybody, Father Joe Freedy. I'm the uh, priest of the Diocese of Pittsburgh, and I'm talking to you about identity today, which is so beautiful because it's something uh, that I've struggled with my whole life. And, and questions of identity um, are always the deepest questions we can ask, right? So who am I? Who are you? Who is God? Beautiful story about St. Francis, right? In the middle of the night, his brothers um, caught him praying, right in front of the tabernacle, just praying, who are you, Lord? And who am I, right? Questions of identity. I remember when I got into college, and I, I'll tell this story, but um, I wasn't the starting quarterback right away like I was in high school. I remember asking, like, who am I, right? We vote our identity on different things. And parents, when the kids leave the house, right, often there's a time where mom and dad have a really hard time, right, because they're, they're like, who are we apart from our kids? What does it mean to be in a relationship together? So we're talking about identity today. Um, I grew up the youngest of five in, in a town called Bethel Park, which is just south of Pittsburgh. And a wonderful Catholic family, Mass on Sunday for me was like not an option growing up. If you want to live past the age of 10, you went to Mass on Sunday. And, uh, but I, I just, I struggled um, with deep insecurity for a long time in my life and, and uh, just a lot of anxiety, right? And so I remember just as a kid um, being such a people pleaser and, and um, always worrying about what other people thought of me. Uh, when I go, go around and give talks, I always say to the kids, uh, you know, I was like a chameleon. I asked this group of eighth graders one time, what's a chameleon doing? Because it's like, eats flies. And I was like, okay, <laughs> but changes colors. You know, I was a change color guy. Like if, if the cool kids were around, I'd act cool. If the bad kids were around, I'd act bad. If the sport kids were around, I'd, I'd talk about sports. I was always trying to be who I thought other people um, would accept me for. It's an exhausting way to live, you know? And, and maybe you felt that, like just... Huh, always always having the feeling of um, having to perform to be loved, right? Um, and that was me growing up. I was always always worried about people not liking me because I was so insecure in my heart. And uh, you guys know this, but insecurity grasps for security. And anxiety grasps for peace. Like we can't abide in security, so we try and get out of it. We can't abide anxiety, so we try and get out of it, right? And like what are the super classic ways? Uh, money, power, pleasure, fame, like all those things, right? The derivatives of all of the big four that they're called. Um, for me, it, it was like sports. I was good at sports, football, baseball, basketball. Everything I, I, I did in sports, I was, I was good at. And uh, I became the starting quarterback at, at the high school I was at, Bethel Park High School, when I was a sophomore. And in western Pennsylvania, that's where Pittsburgh is, um, football, high school football is a big deal. Um, it's like western Pennsylvania, Ohio, Florida, Texas, real big deal. In Western Pennsylvania, so I became the starting quarterback as a sophomore. And I was like, "Yes, like I have found it. I am the man." You know, and, uh, my buddies always laugh. Like I have the stereo on my shoulder on the roller skates. That's how old I am. Um, but you know, I, I basically built my whole identity on on that, on being a good football player. And that, it's like, man, we build our identity on so many different things. You know, like uh, I'm the cool kid, I'm the funny kid, I'm the smart kid, I'm the pretty girl, I'm the, I'm the culture project missionary. I'm the, you know, it's like I'm the priest, I'm the funny priest, I'm the this priest, I'm that priest. Um, we just build our identity, and it's you, the, the parable in the scriptures. Like scriptures are so applicable. The house on sand or the house on rock. The house on sand is the house built on all these identities, and we do it in. Oh, it's like we build our identities on on what we have or what we do rather than who we are. So dangerous. Setting ourselves up for such a collapse, right? I'm the I'm the funny kid and then somebody funnier comes in, it's like boom, I'm the pretty girl, and then somebody prettier comes and it's like boom, you know, it's um such a trap the devil the devil lays for us. I think I was so anxious and su su suffered from insecurity because um I have wonderful parents, but I don't know if I was affirmed in a way that I could receive it in my identity. You know, Peter Kreef tells a great story about his own son who was five, comes up to him and asks this question, Dad, why do you love me? And uh, his dad, Peter, started saying, like, I love you because you're, you're such a good son to your mother. I love you because you're, you're such a good brother to your sister. I love you because you always do, you know, what we ask you to do so quickly. And, he could see every time he was given one of those answers, his son was getting more and more down. And then he realized, Peter Kreef realized what his son wanted to hear. And he said, son, um, I love you because you're you and because you're mine. I love you, son, because you're mine. He said his five-year-old son just like, 
you know, got so proud and happy, and, and that's what he needed to hear, that the love of his father wasn't based on his performance, on his actions, on how good or bad of a kid he was that day, that it was just given. It's unchangeable. And we need to hear that too, and when we don't hear that, right, Dr. Conrad Barge calls this affirmation deprivation disorder, when we don't experience ourselves as beloved, not because of any of these other things, but just because we are, and just because we are His, we've been loved into existence from all eternity, that leads to great insecurity. And that's what I experienced, and, and I grasped, right? The anxiety grasping for peace, the insecurity grasping for security. And uh, this, the football thing was, was my grasping thing. Now I was part of the cool crowd. Now I had the cheerleader girlfriend. Now I was, you know, invited to the parties. I, I was in, and, and so I learned very quickly, like I get applause, I get affirmation that my heart so longs for from performing well. Well, that's like totally setting yourself up because Every game for me was not just like, oh, I hope we win or, or, you know, I hope we don't lose. Every game for me was like my identity's on the line. My worth is on the line. And, and that can transfer to different things. I remember when I first started to go out and giving talks, it was like every talk, my identity was on the line, you know? So my story, I got up into college. I, I earned a football to play, um, or earned a scholarship to play football up at the University of Buffalo. It's a school up in the MAC and, uh, we were terrible every year, <laughs> but I got to play against a bunch of guys who were in the NFL. And some of my buddies went to the NFL, and uh, and I got up into college, and I realized really quickly, like everybody that plays on that level, it was, it was Division One, um, was the star on my high school team. So I wasn't a starting starting quarterback; I was a third string quarterback. So I had like no chance of seeing the field, and uh, the, the the sand collapsed, right? Or the sand washed out, and the house collapsed. My my whole identity was wrapped up in being the center of attention and being the guy because of football, all of a sudden that wasn't there. Fifth string quarterback is like, who cares? Um, so I, I just started to party like really, really hard and, and basically said, if I, if I can't be the center of attention, if I can't be noticed, if I can't be affirmed for being the, the, the football player, uh, I'm gonna get it another way. And, and this was it, I'm gonna be the biggest party on campus. And so really gave myself over to that and uh, it was in a, in a really dark place, man. I remember just being super honest with you. Um, I remember like driving home from a bar uh, one night, uh, you know, totally, totally not sober. And uh, I was hurting so bad. I was like, like, I'm just gonna like jerk the wheel into a telephone pole. Like just this ache, like we long so deeply in our rest and our peace comes from being secure in love. That I am I'm free because I'm loved. That's where true freedom comes from. It comes from the security of knowing how deeply I'm loved. And that was not me. <laughs> and so it just led to all these other things and a few things happened to change my life. I uh, met this beautiful, beautiful woman, and she helped to bring me out of some of the stuff I was into, and then a bunch of things happened. I became the starting quarterback in, in football. God hurt all the other quarterbacks in front of me. Um, just kidding. <laughs> uh, and then the last thing was I read the book by Scott Hahn, The Lamb's Supper, and it just helped me to like understand the faith and that God is real. And um, started to have a conversion. And, you know, I so often tell my story, I was like, and that's the end of the story, and now I'm here, and Everything's okay, you know? It's like, no, it's not the end of the story. Um, I, I entered the seminary after my fifth year, and uh, the Lord had done so much healing in my heart, um, but there were still wounds there. You know, the, the questions about identity, the deepest wounds we can receive are wounds of our identity. And that means that the deepest healing we can receive is the healing of our identity. The deepest wounds we can receive are identity wounds. You are not good. You are not loved. You are not wanted. You are not adequate as a man. You are not beautiful as a woman. It's not good that you exist, right? That's what sarcasm does. It tears us up and tells us you, it's something about that that says it's not good that you exist. Um, the deepest healing we can receive, same thing. 
I am loved. I am wanted. I am valuable. You know, I'm worth dying for. And uh, I, I entered the seminary. I went over to the North American College in Rome, studying over there. And I was about to be ordained a deacon. And uh, my parents were flying over to to be there for the ordination, and, and they they love art. And so they said, "Hey, you know, Joe, take us up to the Uffizi Gallery, which is in Florence." I was like, "Okay, you know." And like three days before, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. Um, all these lies that I had dealt with my whole life about my insecurity came like back really strong. You're not good enough. Look at all these other guys. They're so much smarter than you. They're they're. It's not going to work out. You're pathetic. Look at your past. You are your sins. And it's just this ball of shame and guilt and fear and terror, right? Just hit me and, and it was like totally stole my peace. And guys, you know this, but the devil works through fear and fear is generated through lies. And so there's two names in the scriptures for the devil, Hodiabolos and uh, Hosatanas. Hosatanas is the accuser Diabolos, if there's a Greek, that means um, the divider. It literally means to like throw against. Um, and so all these accusations come to us and we receive them. We take them in and they become part of us. And like we never cast those lies out. We just try and get the love of God in. And that perfect love does cast out all fear, but the lies need to be renounced and rooted out. So I take my parents up to the Uffizi Gallery. And I'm, I'm like almost having a nervous breakdown. Like I'm so terrified about the future, terrified about preaching as a deacon, terrified about all these things. And we're walking around the Uffizi Gallery and um, they're like, this is so beautiful. And I'm like, I'm going to die. You know? <laughs> and I went into this room called the um, Room of Botticelli. He's a very famous Italian painter. And there was a, a painting on the wall um, called the Column de Papeles. Look it up. It's really beautiful. I haven't looked it up for a really long time, so I hope I'm describing it right. But there's a king seated on a throne, and he, he used to be seated very regally and strong. Um, I just remember, I think I have it somewhere. I have it somewhere in the room. <laughs> I don't know where it is right now. But um, he's like beginning to crouch and hunch over. Um, and here's why he's getting very dark, and all the vices are personified, and they're coming up to whisper in his ear. So hatred and anger and and the king is listening to the vices. And as he's listening to, to the vices who are personified, the wrong voices, he's getting dark. So I just guess I would ask, like, what voices do you listen to? What's the tape? What voices do you listen to? Like, do you go throughout the day beating yourself up, accusing yourself? comparing and competing, jealousy, envy. What are the voices, right? Remember one time I was walking across the street and there was like a big no walk sign. The hand was up, it was red, like don't walk. And I looked and I walked anyway and a car came flying around the corner and I jumped back and the Lord gave me a grace to hear myself say to myself, I said internally, you idiot. And it, it you know, I think that sounds funny, but it was dark. And I realized, like, gosh, I would never say that to anybody else. But I had been saying that to myself. It's like the Lord opened the window and gave me a glimpse to see how hard I am on myself. You idiot. It was like, oh, and I was like, oh, my goodness. That's the tape constantly going. You're always making mistakes. You're so stupid. You know, it's like, ah, oh. we grow up with that because we get accused from the outside. We take those accusations and we internalize the external aggressor. We internalize the external aggressor. I see this picture, I beeline toward it, and I realize what was happening to that king was happening to me. That I had given voice, ear, to the wrong voices. All those voices, ooh, the lies. Identify the lies in your life. What are the lies that you've believed about yourself? What are the lies that you've, that you've set up? Maybe they're so deep that you, you need to pray to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, reveal Reveal to heal me. Show me what are the lies I believe that have enslaved me or that have um, clipped my wings or that have just kept me from living life to the full. They, they need to be exposed and then renounced. In the back of the line, the last person is truth. 
and she's naked and she's pointing to heaven as if to say to the king, that's the voice you should be listening to. Guys, literally it was like, boom, it was a, one of these moments where it's like the heavens were torn open, like in Mark in the baptism of Jesus. And I heard the voice of the Father really deeply say, like Job, I've given you my beloved son. Listen to him. It's a transfiguration. So it was like, for me, it was a transfiguration moment. Listen to him. And guys, what does Jesus say? What does God say in the Old Testament and then say through Christ verbally, but also so much more powerfully by his actions on the cross? Like, before you were in the womb, I knew you. Before you were formed, like I created you, I willed you into being, I love you. And Jeremiah, I know well the plans I have in mind for you, plans for your welfare, not for you. Well, um, I've called you by name, counted the hairs on your head, you're carved into the palms of my hands. Uh, you're my beloved, you're my work of art. When I was born, uh, my mom prayed for a scripture passage for me. It's, it's you are God's work of art, Ephesians 2.10. And my, my Aunt Janet was driving up. She's a Baptist from West Virginia. She stopped at a little baby store, got a blue shirt. She thought, uh, I don't know if it's a boy or a girl, but if it's a girl, she could wear blue too. Brought it in. My mom wouldn't tell her uh, if, I, you know, yet, if I was a boy or a girl on the way there. And then... She said, it's a boy. And my auntie, I said, I'm so glad it's got a blue t-shirt. She held up a blue t-shirt. And on a blue t-shirt, it said, God's work of art. It's like, that's who I am, you know? And that's who, that's who you are. And uh, that's what God wants to say. That I'm his work of art. And it's, it's hard, guys, even like right now, to speak that out loud. Because I'm so aware of my own foibles. And I'm so aware of my own weaknesses. And I'm so aware of my own sins that I'm so aware that I'm not yet the man that God has called me to fully be and I'm not the priest that God has called me to be you know that I that I fall short you know just thousands of times a day uh, but as John Paul II said like we're not the summary of our weaknesses and failures right we're the summary of the father and his love for us that for me was a game changer Renouncing in the name of Jesus, I renounce the lie that I am stupid. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the lie that I'm unlovable. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the lie that uh, I am my past sins. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the lie that I'm not beautiful. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the lie. Whatever the lies are, in the name of Jesus, to renounce them. And then you have to do the negative, but then you have to do the positive. In the name of Jesus, I believe that I am loved. In the name of Jesus, I believe that I am wanted. In the name of Jesus, I believe that I am God's work of art. It's amazing. That's where freedom comes from. Let me just end with this. Uh, I think there's only 15 minutes for this video. I don't know how long I've gone. But um, it's one thing to receive the love of God. I think a lot of my problem was not so much me and God, it was me and me. And that might sound like 70s, 80s, hippie, whatever. But like, God commands us to love, right? And that includes self-love. And so for so long, I was like, you know, if I just understood God's love more powerfully, I'd be totally free. And it's true, but like, I also have to love and accept myself. And, and you have to love and accept yourself. So one of the things I started to profess also was in the name of Jesus, I accept myself. In the name of Jesus, I forgive myself. In the name of Jesus, um, whatever, I, I accept who I am. I accept my personality. I accept my stature. I accept how tall I am. I accept that I'm extroverted rather than introverted. I accept whatever it is, like self-acceptance is the door that opens up to receive God's love for us. Have you accepted yourself and all of your radical unacceptability, right? I think that was Father Henry Nowen or something he said. Um, accepting ourselves and all of our unacceptability because we've been accepted by God. So 
I'll just stand there and say, man, like our deepest identity, you guys know this, you te probably teach this, many of you, um, your beloved, his beloved, like the song says, his beloved, his creation, and uh, and nothing can ever change that. Not, not anything you, you do positively, anything you do negatively, sins, virtues, vices, whatever. Um, you're just loved by God. And so I, I just pray that the Holy Spirit would convict you of your own belovedness and that this day you would remember who you are. That before anything else, for your accomplishments or your foibles, your child, your child of God. God bless you guys.